Another one of the twelve forests of Vrindavan. And the name of that forest is? Halavan. I just got a Talavan 101 education about what what tal fruits are like. I'm, and I'm going to ask Hari Leela to describe this for you. You're on. So when we hear how enthusiastic the cowherd boys were to enjoy are growing up. You don't find trees where branches are growing down and roots growing up, except in a reflection, where in the reflection of a tree, in the water, on a lake, in the reflection, the roots are growing up and the branches are growing down. So this material world is just a reflection 
of the spiritual world. Like in the Bhagavatam verse the other morning, where the Supreme Lord appeared as Lord Varaha to kill Haranyakashipu. He's described there as Adi Shukara, the original or So where do the forms of boar come from? From the spiritual world, from the supreme. Where does the playfulness of little children, where does that come from? It comes from Krishna Balaram. Where does the attraction between young boy and young girl, where does that come from? It comes from Radha and Krishna. Whatever exists in this realm has its pure manifestation in the spiritual realm. So in hearing about the pastimes of Krishna and Balaram and Raja, we're hearing the pure form of what may seem like frivolous play, but it's an exchange of love between Krishna, Balaram, and his devotees. Just like even before they begin their play for the day, some of you may have read the BBT translation of Brihad Bhagavatamrita. Brihat Bhagavatamrita describes Krishna's going out to herd the calves with his cowherd voice. And how intense is the love and affection of Nanda and Jasoda and the elder Gopas and Gopis. They're so much attached to Krishna in their parental affection, that they don't want to lose that presence of Krishna. This month of Kartik has many, many wonderful festival days in it. One of them is Gopastami. Gopastami is a festival when the inauguration of Krishna and Balaram taking the cows out into the pasture ground. He graduated into that stage of his life. The big festival, Gopastami festival. Krishna becomes Gopa, Gopa Kumar, to herd the cows. So, all the elders came and made wonderful presentations. Some gave Krishna new flute, some gave Krishna some special turban to wear, some gave Krishna a nice chatter to wear, some gave Krishna different pen, buffalo horn, so we could blow the buffalo horn and call the cows. And little lati, little stick for controlling the cows. So much nice gifts. This is described in Bhopal Champu, the celebration of Bhopastami. Mother Jasoda, she presented Krishna with some very beautiful shoes and a, and a little umbrella. And it describes in detail those shoes, little sparkling, almost like mirrors on the side of the shoes and with the toes going I've seen those in Rajasthan. You see? Growing up. So she presented the shoes to Krishna and the umbrella to Krishna very happily because she's Mother Jasoda. She doesn't want her little Lala to go out into the forest with sharp stones and thorns. And Krishna refused. Krishna said, how is it that we're cowherds, we're to protect the cows, and I wear shoes, 
and they have no shoes. <laughs> I will accept these shoes if you provide for each one of Nanda Maharaj's cows the same shoes. Because their feet may hurt also. And then the umbrella. How I can have an umbrella if they don't have an umbrella? You provide an umbrella and someone to carry the umbrella for each of the cows, then I'll take an umbrella. <laughs> Because our life is to protect the cows. Such love Mother Jasoda has for Krishna, and such love Krishna has for the cows. But as in Brihad Bhagavatamrita it describes, making all the arrangements, Mother Jasoda packed sumptuous lunch for Krishna. Fed him sumptuously for breakfast because her little boy doesn't want him to be hungry. And so he smiled and said, it's time to go. The cows are mooing. The cowherd boys are blowing their horns. It's, I must go now, mother. Very well. And Krishna walked a few feet and Mother Jasoda ran up and said, no, no, wait, let me adjust your don't you hear? Let me fix this. Sat in front of her. Okay, now you can go. Took a few steps. No, no, let me fix your turban. It's not on right. Let me fix your turban. Then she ran back to the house and got some more kachoris and put them in Balaram's lunchbox. Make sure that Krishna, if he gets hungry, he has something more. And again and again, five, six times, Mother Jasoda running after Krishna. No, wait, wait. Because she had such affection, she didn't want to be without her little son's association. And the cowherd boys were saying, come on, Krishna. <laughs> and Krishna was saying, very well, Mother, but I have to go. It's time to go herd the cows. And finally he left. And the description is that all the residents of Vrindavan town would watch as Krishna went into the forest. They could no longer see his form. They could just see the dust raised from the hooves of the cows as they went into the forest and the pasturing grounds. And they stood there like statues. But their hearts feeling intense separation from Krishna. That's the Vatsalya group. But the Sakya group, this is their time. <laughs> and they were so enthralled with playing with Krishna that as they were going deeper and deeper into the forest, Prabhupada describes that actually all they did was play. And because the cows had the same affection in their particular rasa for Krishna, they just followed Krishna wherever he went. Sometimes they would see the birds flying in the sky and the birds would be casting a shadow onto the ground and they would go running after the shadow of the birds. Then another boy would make a motion of a bird and make shadows on the ground and they would, another boy would follow the shadow on the ground. Sometimes they would come by a lake or a pond and one of the boys would stand on one leg like a crane dipping to get the fish into the water. And another boy would stretch his leg, one leg back and one leg forward, making like the peacock, spreading his peacock feathers. And some other boys would make a loud, roaring sound, like a wild, um, big animal, like a lion. And the other boys would run like the deer, leaping just imitating the movements 
of the animals and the birds in the forest. One boy would sit like a frog and make the sound, the croaking sound like a frog. I can't make that sound. <laughs> then jump like a frog. And then jump like a frog. Jump like a frog. Then another boy would come and jump over the frog like a frog. <laughs> Just play. Sometimes Krishna would lean up against a tree and play upon his flute. And all the cows would stop chewing the grass with their ears perked up just to catch the sound of Krishna's flute playing. And the cowherd boys would gather around Krishna just like petals of a lotus, listening completely enchanted to the sound of Krishna's flute. The birds flying in the air would stop flying and come crashing to the ground, stunned at hearing the sound of Krishna's flute. Sometimes they play a game of throwing one fruit from a fruit tree, throwing it up in the air and trying to hit it with another fruit as it fell to the ground. And they could do this for hours. Sometimes they play tag. Sometimes they put a blindfold on one of the cowherd boys spin him around three times and have him move around with his arms out and all the other coward boys had to stand still till he found one of the coward boys and then by just by touching the features of the boy tried to name who that coward boy was. So many games they would play all day long. Just play and play and play and play and play. And play going deeper and deeper into the forest and the cows enjoying just being in Krishna's company. In this way, one day when the cowherd boys were in the Taliban forest where we are now, some of the cowherd boys came and reported to Krishna and Balaram. There's this wonderful forest nearby with many, many tall, tall trees with so many fruits. And Krishna and Balaram, the fruits are so fragrant. The whole forest is filled with such wonderful scent. And these fruits were sure they're very sweet. We're wanting some of those fruits. Can you help us get some of those fruits? We want to go, but there's one terrible demon named Danoka. And he lives in that forest, and he's very envious. He doesn't allow any living entity to come in that forest and enjoy those fruits. Not only us as humans, but no animals, no birds, not even insects. Danuk is so cruel, so envious. He keeps everyone away. He wants to enjoy for himself. But the fruits are irresistibly <laughs> fragrant and sweet. <laughs> Krishna Balaram, can you help us get some of those fruits? Krishna turned to Balaram, let us go. Each of the time there were demons, Krishna and Balaram knew, or at least Krishna knew, that because there's some circumstances like with Columbus or Balaram made like he didn't know, or Yoga Maya was covering so he apparently didn't know who Palumba was. But he knew who Dainuka was. And they went straight to these very, very tall trees. And Balaram grabbed one of the biggest ones of them and with his strength 
he shook the tree. And as he shook the tree, many, many fruits came falling to the ground. And the calendar boys were very happy, picking up the fruits, getting ready to enjoy the fruits. But the sound made by the tree shaking and the tall fruits falling was heard by Danuka, who became very, very angry. Who has come into my forest to take my fruits? And galloping, charging with great speed, he came running into the forest, followed by his other ass demon friends. <laughs> And when he saw Balaram standing there smiling, leaning against the tree that he had just shaken, he came charging right at him and turned around and, as asses have a practice of doing, kicked very hard with his rear feet, hooves, and kicked Balaram right in the chest. Balaram didn't move a fraction of an inch. Just smiled. He didn't even say ouch. <laughs> Which made Danuka even more angry. So he took another pass at Balaram and charged at Balaram. And Balaram, there's different versions of this pastime. I'll just narrate the one that's found in Bhagavatam, but the one that Rupa Goswami describes is very exciting. <laughs> I'll do that as part two. He grabbed Nedakasura by the hind leg as he tried to kick him and threw him to the ground. <coughs> Stunned Nedakasura. So Dedekasura got up, because demons are very determined, and charged again. Next time, Balaram took him and twirled him around and around and around and threw him up into the top of one of the tall, tall trees. And he was so heavy, Dedeka was so big, that the tall tree crashed into another tall tree, which crashed into another tall tree, which crashed into another tall tree, and broken tall trees all over the forest. And the sound of all the tall trees crashing, and the uh, thrashing of Danica brought the other ass demons, and they all came charging at Krishna and Balaram, and they did the same thing as they turned around to kick them. They grabbed their hind legs and threw them around and around and around and around. And around. And by centrifugal force, they lost their life. The Bhagavatam describes that they were, they were multicolored demons that looked like multicolored clouds in the sky decorating the tops of the tall trees. And the cowherd boys exclaimed, well done, well done. <laughs> Let us enjoy the tall fruits now. Wait till we tell everybody when we get back to Braja what Krishna and Balaram did today. In Rupa Goswami's description, he describes that Krishna threw Dainaka Balaram through Dainaka a long distance. And he went crashing to the ground. And when he came back, he lost consciousness. When he came back, he charged again even stronger. So when, when Balaram threw him to the ground the second time, the cowherd boys each came with their sticks. Some were punching him, some were kicking him, some were hitting him with their sticks. <laughs> some were pulling his tail and slapping him in the face. Trying to help Balaram do 
deal with this demon. And they were strong. And he got up and charged again. By Krishna's destroying Denuka, it demonstrates how kind Krishna is in taking away the ass like propensities of living entities, the load bearing propensities, the I have to work hard mentality of the conditioned living entity, which we find very strong in material society. Persons work very, very hard. I would say if anybody here has done some book distribution in wherever you are, as I have done, you will have heard this hundreds and hundreds of times. I have no time. I have, I don't, I, I don't have time for this. I have to work hard. Or they'll say it the other way around. They'll say, get a job. You should work hard. You should be an ass like me. Because what is life without working hard? For material, affairs of life. I recently had an experience, well, two, two, two recent experiences that I found astonishing. One was I had, um, it was a couple years ago, I had a, I made a commitment to, to visit somebody, to visit a temple, on Christmas Day, and I had an, an evening program on Christmas Eve. So without the details, I had a very, very early flight. I mean, I, I left our New York temple at something like five o'clock in the morning. And as I was driving at five o'clock in the morning, I saw at a car wash near the temple, a line of cars about 20 cars long at 5 o'clock in the morning on Christmas morning in America, in New York City. But my God, people can't give up trying to enjoy 5 o'clock in the morning on Christmas morning. And then when I got to the airport, there was a line at 5.30 in the morning a line of people waiting to check in that was filling up, it was so long, it filled up the whole front lobby and went out into the sidewalk outside the airport at 5.30 in the morning. I nearly missed my flight because there was so many people to just check in. And then there was a, um, it was one of those flights that I had to make a change of planes in one city. And when I got off the plane, because it was in a western time zone, so it was an hour earlier, it was now about 7 o'clock in the morning in Minneapolis, in the transit lounge of Northwest. And the, the whole place was filled with people just sitting around eating in all of those eating places in airports. At 7 o'clock in the morning, on Christmas morning, but my God, these American people, they're so determined to enjoy. <laughs> they're suffering so much at 5 o'clock in the morning, 5.30 in the morning, 7 o'clock in the morning on Christmas morning, instead of having you know, a religious holiday. That's what, that's what it is. It's the Vegas Christian religious holiday. And they're off just sense gratification X, Y, and Z. Unbelievable. Then 
Another situation that happened very recently, I was going from Penn State University. Those of you that are from America, you know where, where that is. It's in mid-Pennsylvania and kind of like off in the mountains of nowhere. And the flight that I had to get to was in Harrisburg, Pennsylvania, the, the state capital. Like, you know, normally, like an hour and a half's drive. Is it? So, but it was an early morning flight, so I had to leave early. And, and, the, and the roadway was, it was a high, you know, the, the, the two lanes each way divided highway. It was packed with cars on a weekday at five o'clock in the morning. It was like rush hour. From nowhere to somewhere at five o'clock in the morning. <laughs> I thought, this is going to be terrible when we get to somewhere. It's going to be terrible, you know, double packed. But even nowhere, packed. <coughs> what to speak of places in India? Big cities in India in the early morning hours. I once had to visit the Juhu Temple, and they suggested I, I had come by train from somewhere, rather than going, those of you that are from Bombay would know, rather than going by car, it's much better if you go by train because it takes less time to go from the train station to the Juhu Temple than going by car. It'll take you two to three times more. So I got on the train, and I didn't know what would happen. It was rush hour. And I started in car number one, and I ended up in car number four without walking. <laughs> Just by getting pushed by the people trying to get in car one, because they were trying to get on the, in the, in the each stop. It was, I had never had such an experience. I've been in subways in New York at rush hour, but never like that. <laughs> Unbelievable, and that was so many years ago. What is it like now? <laughs> or Calcutta, at, you know, rush hour, trying to get across the Howrah Bridge to the Howrah Station. Forget it, rush hour. It's a madhouse. Etc. Etc. This is Danuka. <laughs> Modern Danuka in the towel forest, trying to get and to enjoy the towel fruits, and no one else should enjoy the towel fruits. The envious spirit of working very hard, can't like the ass, which we don't have in the West, but which is, exists here in India, certainly in villages. Prabhupada would speak about it many times, apparently as a small boy he saw, he would describe Literally, tons or big, huge loads billowing down the side of whatever it was. Prabhupada would often say, laundry. The washerman would pile up the ass, big pile of clothes, take the, the ass to the washing place and pile up again at the end of the day and bring it back home. For what? Got to work hard. Got to get that morsel of grass so I can have something to eat. Which Prabhupada would say, "Look on either side of the road, and you see abundant grass." <laughs> Why are you working so hard? I got to work hard so I can get that morsel of grass. I can get that enjoyment. This mentality. You go on and on and on about it. I just received a letter just yesterday from someone who was describing they've got this, they're in a something something education program where they have to work 10 to 12 hours a day just to get that piece of grass. <laughs> that PhD. What's the PhD for? So they get, you know, morsel and a half of grass. <laughs> What should I do, Maharaj? <laughs> Go to the tall forest. <laughs> Find Krishna and Balaram. Kill, kill that Peter Kassar. <laughs> Liberate you from.
from bed. <laughs> mentality. Because it interferes, that mentality interferes with taking shelter of Krishna in a feeling way, in a mood of devotion. You've got to work hard. Even they, even so, as devotees, we have our ways of addressing these things. But the non-devotee, the asura, this is their life. And Krishna is kind upon the asura also. He takes away that mentality. Or at least lets them understand the futility. He gives them plenty of opportunity to understand that futility. And in the life of a devotee, Krishna is very kind and Krishna helps us become free from that mentality by his kindness. And he shows that to his devotees, to the elder boys. And one very nice thing of this pastime is that there, there are two demons, specifically in the Rajalila, where Balaram kills the demons instead of Krishna. Have you noted? There's two. Denukasura and Pamambhasura. Here's what Bhakti Vinod Thakur says. That the demons that Krishna kills is Krishna's reciprocation with the devotee for obstacles on the path of devotional service. Krishna removes. But there are these two where the devotee has to turn to Balaram and with the effort, as we discussed, prayasa, the effort to try to overcome this obstacle, the devotee must strive to overcome this obstacle on the instruction of the scripture and the spiritual master. Then Balaram gives the strength because within the instruction comes the strength to carry out the instruction. We need not become beasts of burden or over endeavorers for ordinary things of life. This is one of our Vaishnava teachings. We accept those things which come in a natural way and we don't over endeavor for things otherwise. Even let's say by something, the example that Prabhupada would give even of constructing a nice temple. This is a lesson that Prabhupada, I saw it in letters that Prabhupada was writing to the devotees in New York when there was an idea to move from where we were to some other place. And Prabhupada's concern was that we not put ourselves in a position where each month, the third, he wrote in the letter, the third week into the month, we're in anxiety, how we're going to meet the payments. Don't do that. Don't be, don't be Danukas. He didn't say just like that in the letter, but that's the message. Where we're over endeavoring for something. The Prabhupada certainly gave challenges to the devotees. The building of the Mayapur temple and the Vrindavan temple and the Juhu temple. He put, he taxed us to strive. But not to the point where it, it was um, disrupting our spiritual lives and our devotional practice. And that the spiritual purpose was not for material gain. The spiritual purpose was his life was short and he wanted to leave behind just as, I mean, look at the Krishna Bhadra Mandir today. How many people are getting spiritual benefit by coming there? That if we just sat under a tree, the same would not happen. So Prabhupada understood what a beautiful temple for Krishna would provide in, in Vrindavan. So this is a very peaceful place. Just we're being very much benefited by the 
pujaris and the devotees maintaining this place, providing such a nice, cool, pleasant scene. Nice big lake over here on this side. And we don't see too many tall trees anymore. <laughs> but one can only imagine the abundant tall trees with nice fragrant fruits. Cowherd boys want to enjoy and offer to Krishna. Shri Krishna Balaram Ki
protection and the Goshal connected with Krishna Balaram Mandir. And hopefully he'll also introduce us to the two newborn calves. Okay. So uh, I guess most of you are from India. So uh, how many of you ever have uh, taken milk out from a cow? <laughs> So I guess you're all more or less from the city. <laughs> so, um, particularly in Vrindavan, the cows uh, play a very special role because uh, the planet where we are uh, uh, kind of amputating to go, we want to go to Goloka Vrindavan or this, uh, this uh, place is called Gokul where Krishna has grown up. So the cows uh, have a very important role and it is also said Go Brahmana Hitayacha. So we cannot uh, uh, have Krishna and uh, we cannot be involved with the cows, particularly here in Vrindavan. Whenever you see uh, pictures with Krishna, always the cows are there. So also in a normal range, the cows are very important. The cows are our mother, because she's giving us milk when we're small babies. Every, all the mothers are know when, uh, when this baby is small, we have to supply milk. And the bull, in a usual sense, these days this has been changed, but it uh, looks like many of you are from south in the south. The bulls are still very widely used. The bull is our father because he's used for plowing the field and uh, for pulling loads. So uh, when we are thinking about cows, usually people are thinking about milk. Uh, but actually uh, it is like uh, if you would uh, put up a deity and you would think about making money from that. That is actually a wrong conception. Cows are there to be served. And by serving the cows we get purified at any point. So not necessarily that we want a cow so we want to get milk from her, so actually the cows are there to be served. So we are trying that our best and in this particular Goshala we are, we are kind of supplying all the milk to the uh, deities, Krishna, Balaram, Radha, Shama, Sunda and Gorni type. It is a problem because we have lots of cows, we have less land and the bulls are not engaged. So usually uh, when any one of you is planning to take a cow or to open a Goshala, you should always first see if there is also land uh, where the bulls can do plowing, uh, if that is not the given point, uh, then it is actually a problem because once we start taking out the milk, the cows will be coming, some of them will be boys, and uh, there will be a kind of, how you call that, workless, in a workless condition, and uh, then we have created a problem. So we are also facing that problem here, like uh, most of the Goshala, because uh, the land is getting less and less. As you see, Vrindavan used to be a village. Krishna used to live in a village. This used to be all forest. Uh, and the cows would be just roaming. And if you see some 50, or I think 50 years back, or 100 years back, it was not costing anything. I could have the same amount of cows which I'm having here. This would not cost me anything. I would have two labors. And in the morning, they make the cows loose and they will go in the forest, they will be grazing. In the evening they will be coming back, they will take out the milk and that's it. 
Maybe I'll erect some sheds in the forest from the same wood which is available with grass, which is available, it won't cost me anything. Now in this condition we're spending about uh, between four to five leg rupees every month to maintain the goshala. So it has become a problem. So as the uh, artificial lifestyle is increasing, it becomes more and more difficult for doing what is actually a very pious activity and which is our dharma to take care of the cows uh, and the boats. So if uh, anyone is uh, having a question on that, uh, we could answer that. We have about 340 animals, out of this 140 are bulls. Uh, about 35 animals are, are giving milk, uh, some are even small amounts of milk. So we have a total of 65 liters in the morning, which entirely goes for the deities, for the milk sweets and uh, for, for honey and different things and uh, about 55 uh, liters in the evening, which some goes to the deities and the rest is getting distributed amongst the devotees. All right? Fine. Take us a tour of where are the different parts of the Goshal. Uh.
They're doing their renovations here, but I'm sure it's going to look different than I remember it so many, 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 many times visiting in the past. But the transcendental significance of this place remains the same. This is the Parikrama path. It used to be very 
nice and nice soft sand of Raja, and now it's this asphalt of Kali Yuga. <laughs> but right along here is where the river Jamuna used to flow, and these extensions were like docks or areas where the devotees of the Lord could have view of the Jamuna and enter into the Jamuna. We'll see how time permits and all the other considerations, but um, in, during this this year, one year we were here also when it was the Purushottam month year, and many, 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 many devotees come to Braja in this year that is the same year as the Purushottam month. So we went on this Braj Prakrama path on a Kadasi day. Is anybody here that remembers that? Tanishta, do you remember that experience? It was like New York City at rush hour heading for the subways. <laughs> All the way around the entire Prikrama path. Or going to a soccer game or some of the, uh, whatever else your experience might be. Wall to wall people, as, as wide as the path, non stop, all the way around. Yes. All day long. We went early in the morning, we visited some places, Radha Damodar Temple, and here and there, and we went back on the path, and it was packed, and by the evening it was packed. All day long, packed. Very what to speak with the rest of Braja, but this, just this area alone was with so many people. <coughs> Some of our devotees do this on a regular basis. One devotee that lives here, that I, I spoke to while here, and every morning, part of the 80 rounds she chants every day is after Tulsi Puja, she does the Prikrama path and goes back and greets the deities and Guru Puja, then chants the, you know, the rest of her 80 rounds a day, along with other seva to the deities. That's, this is like a heartbeat of the devotees <clears throat> in Vrindavan. I think our um, Hare Krishna Food for Life program headed by Rupa Raghunath, some of you know him. Uh, they, they hire someone to go around the Prikrama path every day and pick up litter because it was unsightly, the condition. Just to help beautify and make the, uh, you know, a proper presentation of such a sacred place. And <clears throat> This particular location is Kaliagat, where Krishna performed a very, very wonderful pastime. During his manifest Leela here in Vrindavan, one day, Every morning, Krishna would go out with the cows and the calves and the gopas. And as we heard earlier today, all day long simply play. It was called herding the cows. <laughs> it would simply play. So one day, the cows and the calves Minus Balaram. Balaram stayed home that day. Doesn't say why he stayed home. Maybe it was his birthday. <laughs> but he stayed home that day. But the normal path that the cows would follow is a little variegated, of course, but a certain routine they would follow in the course of the day. But this particular day, they went straight for the river Jamuna. 
because by the influence of the Lord's potency, his Yogamaya potency, they became uncontrollably thirsty. So they went straight to the Jamuna River and right here to the Kaliya Lake <coughs> and began drinking water. Unfortunately, the water was terribly poisonous and so they instantly fell to the ground as if dead. And Krishna was behind them. And when he came to the scene where he saw all the cows and all the cowherd boys stretched out on the ground as if dead, Krishna became overwhelmed and bewildered by his own Yogamaya potency. This is a very important part of the Leela. The Yogamaya potency is Krishna's potency. And Krishna's Yogamaya potency even acts on Krishna. So that his enjoyment of pastimes is increased. So when Krishna wants to enjoy his pastime of just like we're, as we said earlier today, anything that we find in this world has its spiritual counterpart in the spiritual world. But it's without flaw or imperfection or inibrity. It's pure and unalloyed love. That is Krishna. Rasa by Saha, the Vedas state. Krishna is Rasa. The Absolute Truth is Rasa. So Krishna enjoys. And one of the ways in which he enjoys is this way. Becoming bewildered. Just like when the cowherd boys entered into the mouth of the Agasura demon. Same thing. By Yoga Maya potency, Krishna became bewildered. Because he understood this terrible Agasura demon wants to kill the cowherd boys. He wanted to say, Shukadev Goswami says, he wanted to tell the cowherd boys, don't go. But before he could speak, they went. They were entering the mouth of the Agasura demon and Krishna was thinking, they are completely attached to me. Without me, they have no life. And once they enter into Agasura's mouth, anything could happen. So it wasn't he would lose them, rather they would lose him. And the thought was an unthinkable thought. So he became influenced by his own Yoga Maya potency. Then that particular feature of Yoga Maya moved. Then Krishna thought the next thought. How will I free the cowherd boys at the same time kill this Agasura demon? How will I kill the demon without harming the cowherd boys? Now Krishna is omniscient. Why is he pondering how to do something? He's enjoying. Where does our capacity to think sequentially something come from? From Krishna. Krishna enjoys. But it's infallible. It's not like our process. When It's important when describing and contemplating, meditating, appreciating the pastimes of Krishna. It's it's all pure and perfect. It's not like us. We're like him, imperfectly. Then Krishna knew, yes, I know how to destroy a Gasura without the coward boys being harmed. So he entered into the mouth also and then expanded himself bigger and bigger. So when Krishna came to the Kali Lake and saw the cowherd boys and the cows looking as if they were dead, he was bewildered. Hmm. 
But actually, even before he got to that location, it was his Leela. He knew what was going to happen, and he knew what he was going to do. He knew that in this lake was a very terrible personality in the form of a snake. The scriptures give us a very wonderful explanation of how Kaliya got here and who Kaliya was. In his previous life, Kaliya was a sage whose name was Veda Shira. <coughs> During Satya Yuga, Veda Shira was engaged in austerities and meditation, because that was the process of Satya Yuga, in the Vindhya Hills. And in a very, very beautiful ashram, high up in a mountain, very, very pleasing atmosphere, very peaceful, filled with flowering trees and sweet-sounding birds. First, ideal place for meditation. So, Ascha Shira, another sage, happened to discover the same location and saw the beauty of the place. And so he approached Veda Shira and suggested that somewhere nearby perhaps he could stay and also engage in meditation and austerities and Veda Shira's reply was there's not room in this mountain for both of us you're going to have to find another place Ashta Shira was amazed he said you're a learned person and certainly you know that the whole of creation belongs to Mahavishnu. He created it. It's His. How can anyone think this belongs to me? Or that belongs to me? You're an elevated personality. How can you think otherwise? Please reconsider. Vita Shira repeated himself. This mountain is not big enough for both of us you're going to have to find another place to do your meditation. Ashtashira said, I can't believe my ears. You're speaking like an envious snake. I curse you. You become a snake in your next life. And Vedashira replied, Very well, I curse you. You become a crow. <laughs> Now, what kind of behavior is this between sages? <laughs> Not very sage-like. But actually, there was a higher purpose behind it. Between the cursing of each of the sages of the other, built in was a benediction that they would achieve during that lifetime as a crow and as a snake. Perfection of life. You know, in Nila Parvat, in the description of the appearance of Lord Jagannath, the story of Nila Madhav, who was on top of Nila Parvat, and by Nila Parvat there was a Rohini Kund. You know this story? Rohini Kund. And one sage was describing this to King Indradumna. There is this place that it's so sacred that one crow, when going to drink some water from Rohini Kund, just by catching a beakful of water in Rohini Kund, immediately his body transformed to, to, into a Vaikuntha figure and went ascending into the spiritual sky just by touching the water of Rohini Kund. That was Ashtashira. Vedashira became Kaliya. So those of you that have read the sixth canto of Srimad Bhagavatam know that Daksha, the second Daksha, Daksha part two, um, had 
10,000 sons, the Hariyashvas, and 1,000 sons, the Subhalashvas, and they were all made into perfected souls by the association of Narada Muni. Right? And then Daksha became very angry at Narada Muni, and Daksha cursed Narada. You cannot stay in one place for more than three days because of your serious offense against a great personality, namely myself. <laughs> You've done injustice to my very elevated sons. So following the Hariyashvas and Savalashvas, Daksha then produced daughters. And eleven of those daughters were awarded to Kashyapa Muni. And one of those daughters was Kadru. And from Kadru and the combination of Kadru and Kashyapa Muni, many different, in fact, the daughters of Daksha with Kashyapa Muni produced so many varieties of forms of life. This is described in the sixth canto of the Bhagavatam. And one of those productions of the combination of Kasyapa and Kadru were birds, Garuda heading those birds, and snakes headed by Anantashesh. Now it's not that Anantashesh is born, but he, like Krishna, makes his appearance and Garuda made his appearance in this way also. And so, Amongst the serpents was Kaliya. So while Kaliya, this is important part of this whole Leela or lesson from the Bhagavatam, although he was cursed to become a snake, although previously a sage, his envious mentality didn't change. He was cursed to become a snake because of his envious mentality. He didn't lose it because he became a snake. So, Kaliya, along with his whole serpentine clan, were residing in a place called Ramanaka Lake. Now, some say that this Ramanaka Lake is in the area of Fiji. Anybody here from Fiji or has been to Fiji? No. In Fiji, they're very fond of worshipping Krishna, and particularly his form of Kaliya Krishna. Ramanaka Lake was the residence of these associates of Kaliya. And Garuda, knowing that there's a whole colony of snakes over here, would go there sometime for some food. Because along with fish, snakes, there's also food for uh, large birds like Garuda. So it was a big problem for the community of snakes, Ramanaka Lake. So they had a little mediation with Garuda. They made a deal. The deal was he would come once a month and they would make specific offerings, very opulent offerings to Garuda. And he would come there once per month, receive what he would like, and then they would not be disturbed the rest of the time. So it was very nice for both parties. And the arrangement was in rotation, different families of the serpents would take that responsibility to prepare the offering for Garuda, and when it was Kaliya's turn, he didn't want to do that because he was envious. Why should Garuda get these offerings? It should be for me. So when it was his turn, he prepared a very nice offering and ate the whole offering. You know, to Garuda. And so, Garuda came to know. And he became very angry with Kaliya. And he started with his claws, his talons, and his beak attacking Kaliya. Kaliya fought back. But Karuta is very powerful. 
And he understood, I'm finished. And so he fled from Garuda. But wherever he went, Garuda pursued him very intently. Finally, Garuda took shelter of his elder brother, Ananta. Ananta, please, please tell me what should I do? Garuda is pursuing me. Of course, Ananta understood the envious nature of Kaliya, but said, you're my younger brother, what can I do? I can make this suggestion. You go to a particular lake by the river Jamuna, and in that particular lake, that's one place I know where Garuda will not go. You go to that place, take shelter there, and you'll be safe. Now, why was it that Garuda would not be at all affected? Excuse me. Garuda would not go to this particular lake. And that's another story. <laughs> the story is, described in our scriptures, that Sobering Muni was a yogi during Satya Yuga, and his particular meditation style was he would meditate underwater. <laughs> <laughs> Prabhupada writes about this, yes? In the um, Bhagavatam, that he would meditate underwater because he didn't want to be disturbed by any external things. The way that Prabhupada tells the story is he saw two fish having intercourse while meditating underwater and his mind became agitated. It, is, it, 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 it's, it interrupted his meditation, so he had to go back to scratch all over again. In this particular case, he was meditating underwater, and Gruta came to catch a fish in the river, area of the river Jamuna, just where we are. And, as, and, and Sobri Muni instructed Gruta, don't take fish from this lake. Gruta didn't pay attention, and he took the fish. So Sobri Muni cursed him. You don't come back to this lake ever again. If you do, by my curse, you will at once die. Now, who can <coughs> curse Garuda? He's an eternal associate of Lord Vishnu, not possible. But, he accepted, understanding somehow there's a plan of the Lord here, and so I will accept this curse. Because he willfully accepted, the curse had some effect. So Ananta informed Kaliya, you can go there and Ruta won't bother you. So he came here. We say the Kaliya Lake, although it's the river Jamuna, which means something like a lagoon. So the river Jamuna is flowing and some indentation of water that doesn't flow. So it's called a lake, a lake within a river. Some lakes or some lakes are like that. They're just extensions of a river. You call it a lake. Kaliya Lake. And since Satya Yuga, Kaliya, had been living here through the whole of Satya Yuga, because this incident of the appearance of <coughs> the offspring of Kasyapa and Kadru and the other wives who were daughters of Daksha was very early in Satya Yuga. So the whole of Satya Yuga, then the whole of Treta Yuga, and the whole of Dwarpa Yuga. That's a lot of time where Kaliya was residing here in this lake. And he had made, by his enviousness, he had made the whole lake so poisonous because envy is like poison. And persons that are envious can inflict poison practically on others. <clears throat> the place was so poisonous that the fumes from the lake were so poisonous that as birds would fly over the lake, they would choke on the fumes and fall into the lake dead. And all the trees and growing foliage was completely gone, dead, except for one tree was remaining. 
we passed by that one tree that was remaining just over there a big kadamba tree just on the other side of where we are sitting where they're doing the construction there's a big old kadamba tree it's the same kadamba tree that existed during Krishna's time in fact it's the same kadamba tree that existed during Satya Yuga according to the Puranas because Garuda knew that Krishna would perform some pastime here and so he placed some nectar on the root of that tree so the tree would be immortal like on the heavenly planets long 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 duration of life so that one Kadamba tree remained standing So now going back to Krishna seeing all the cows and cowherd boys looking dead. They were dead. So by his glance, by Krishna's adhyaksha, by his glancing over the calves and the cowherd boys, at once they came back to life. How powerful is Krishna's eyes? unlimitedly powerful angani yasya sakalendriya vritti manti the, just by his eyes Krishna can bring life to the lifeless but Krishna has, is omnipotent by his eyes he can see offerings that we're making and he can eat with his eyes or with his ears Prabhupada said, if we ever tried to eat with our ears, we'd be big trouble. We can't do it and we'd be we'd be harming ourselves. We can't imitate Krishna. Krishna can eat with his eyes. He can eat with his ears. He can bring life to a lifeless person just by glancing. With the eyes of Krishna, or with the eyes of Ramachandra, he boiled the whole Indian Ocean. Those of you that cook, you know, cooking a big feast, how long it may take to boil a big pot of water to make some rice with as much heat as you can get, how long it takes, what to speak of a lake, what to speak of an ocean, just by glancing, how powerful, transcendental, powerful. What to speak of Krishna simply glancing sidelong glances at the gopis. You find in the first canto of Srimad Bhagavatam when Krishna was entering Dwarka, the ladies were at the rooftops keeping a respectful and shy distance from Krishna as he was entering into Dwarka. So Krishna simply glanced upon them and by his glancing upon them he entered into their eyes and then into their hearts and completely satisfied them as if they were in Krishna's personal embrace. How powerful is Krishna's eyes. Just by glancing he revived the cowherd boys and cows. And as he knew when he left the home in that very morning, even before he got to the scene of the Kaliya Lake, he knew what he was there for. He knew that this poisonous situation was due to the presence of Kaliya. And he wanted to relieve the Jamuna from this terrible poison so that the cows and the Brijbasis could come and drink their water from the river Jamuna without any problem. So he then began his Leela of subduing Kaliya. He climbed up this Kadamba tree. He tightened his dhoti around his waist, getting ready for, ready for some action. And jumped into the Kaliya lake and made a big splash. Just like with the Trinavarta demon, Krishna became very, very heavy. Of course he's very heavy. Of course he, he can be lighter than the lightest and heavier than heaviest at his will. But he became very heavy just like the entire cosmic manifestation. What's the weight of the entire cosmic manifestation? 
And that's then there's unlimited numbers of universes that come from the body of Krishna. So his entering into the lake of Kaliya made a huge splash and big waves went to the shore. And Krishna was splashing around having fun in Kaliya's lake. So just like Vedashira, now even more envious, Kaliya heard this big noise going on in Kaliya Lake and he came to the surface of the water looked at Krishna with envy, so much envy that fire was coming from his mouths. Who dares come into my lake? Ah! And immediately went charging at Krishna and tried to bite him. And he bit Krishna in the chest with one of his hoods. He had 1,000 hoods. Each hood had fire coming from the mouth. And Krishna began dodging Kaliya. But Kaliya then caught him and wrapped him up in his coils very tightly. Now this began early in the morning and went on until the afternoon with Krishna in the coils of the Kaliya serpent. Now what did the cowherd boys think when they saw Krishna? Their life and soul in danger. Is it rain out there? Monkey? Yeah. Oh. Okay. Okay. It's a role reversal. The usual role is the devotees in difficulty and they call out for Krishna. <laughs> there is Nanda Maharaj is entering into the mouth of the big serpent and they try to stop the serpent and they can't do anything and they Krishna, Krishna. Or there's a big forest fire, Krishna, Krishna. Or here comes Aristasura, Krishna, Krishna. It's, it's, the devotees are in difficulty and they call out for Krishna. Here's Krishna in difficulty. Who are they going to call out to? Balaram isn't there. He's at home. They're beside themselves with anxiety. What are they going to do? Terrible grief and very quickly. You know how bad news spreads fast. Krishna's in danger. All over Brunja, all the residents of Brunja came to the shore of this Kaliya Ghat to see Krishna in the coils of Kaliya, their life and soul. The cows were mooing, the peacocks were calling out, the birds were crying. All the animals, all the, all the living entities and all the gopas and gopis and residents of Brunja were in terrible distress. One Brahmana ran by yoga maya potency. He ran to Nandagram. You know how far it is from here to Nandagram? Supposing we, you know, got in a car and we drove in a straight line to Nandagram. Quite a distance. Devotees once asked Prabhupada, how did Krishna do it? You see how far we've gone with all of our travels? Talavan, Madhuvan, and, you know, just get in the car and go a whole bunch of time and come back. Krishna covered the whole of Braja and every day. Devotees asked Prabhupada, how did he One time Prabhupada said, Krishna may have had a big stride. Then another time he said that Vrindavan is like a lotus and sometimes the lotus opens and sometimes the lotus closes. And when the lotus closes then distances become less. The lotus opens and the distances become greater. So by Krishna's will things can expand and contract and move at his will. 
because it's all under his control. That's Krishna. So the Brahmana ran to Nandagram and delivered the message to Nanda Maharaj. Nanda, Nanda, your son is in danger, come quick. Nanda said, what is it, what is it, what happened? Your, your son, little Krishna, is in the coils of this dangerous, terrible, thousand-headed serpent with flames coming from his mouth, just tightening around the body of little Krishna. Nanda looked at the messenger and said, don't worry. Hit his arms. <laughs> These arms! I'll take care of Kaliya. Don't worry. Let's go at once. And Mother Jasoda, I'm going too, I'm going too. No, no, you stay. Everything will be all right. But Mother Jasoda couldn't stay, knowing that Krishna is in danger. What loving mother, knowing that her son is in danger, will stay at home? Immediately she wanted to go. And everyone was preparing quickly, running, and Balaram was just smiling and laughing. <laughs> he understood. Krishna's just playing. Krishna's having fun. There's nothing to worry about. And Balaram came to, and all the residents of Braja, standing by the edge of the lake, looking out and seeing this very difficult circumstance. And they were calling to Krishna, do something. What can we do? They wanted to enter into the lake and try to help Krishna, even though they knew just by entering into the lake, at once they would die because the lake is so poisonous. Balaram had to hold back Nanda Maharaj, his father, <laughs> from entering the lake. And the elder gopis were holding on to Mother Jasoda to keep her from entering into the Kaliya Lake. When the devotees were just fainting as if dead out of this difficult circumstance, Krishna then realized, okay, enough fooling around here, I have to. <laughs> but one of the nice things of this Leela, as in the Govardhan Leela, the one component that both Leelas share, is that simultaneously all the residents of Raja and all the different Rasas were able to experience their relationship with Krishna at the same time. When Krishna was lifting Govardhan Hill, all the residents of Raja were able to see Krishna uninterruptedly for seven days and seven nights, their hearts content. Not a worry in the world to get this small fry Indra. Krishna was their everything. So this also, with all of them ab 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 totally absorbed in Krishna, only in this case with absolutely nothing in the, in the way of protection, because Krishna is in danger. So it's very, very wonderful Leela for the pleasure of his devotees. Then Krishna exhibited his Mahima potency. He made his body bigger and bigger and bigger. And as he made his body bigger, Kaliya was stretched and stretched. And he tried to make his body bigger, and Krishna made his body bigger than Kaliya can make his body. And he was in terrible pain. Finally, Krishna just made his body very small and slipped out of the <laughs> grip of the Kaliya serpent and jumped back in the river Jamuna and began swimming in circles and around and around and around and around and around and around and Kaliya started getting completely dizzy because Krishna was swimming so fast. He was just having fun. And then when Kaliya was exhausted and dizzy, Krishna jumped up on the hoods of Kaliya and stood on his hoods. So while Krishna is standing on his hoods with his hoods, he tried to reach up and bite Krishna. And when he would try to bite Krishna, Krishna would jump on that hood and go from hood to hood to hood to hood and dance and dance and dance and dance and dance. And dance. <laughs> 
Once again, everything that we find in this world has its counterpart in the spiritual world. We find dancing in this world sometimes pretty <laughs> weird varieties of dancing. <laughs> but Krishna is the original dancer. And he was dancing so expertly on the hoods of the stage of Kaliya Serpent. It was a very special stage too because on the hoods of the Kaliya Serpent there were jewels that glowed red. And the soles of Krishna's feet are also reddish. So it looked like Krishna's feet were being illumined as he was dancing and dancing and dancing and dancing. Great stage. <laughs> It was such a wonderful performance that the demigods came <coughs> playing their musical instruments along to accompany Krishna's dancing, singing nice songs to accompany Krishna's dancing. The Gandharvas and the Kinaras and the Apsaras also showing their dancing skills but just amazed by Krishna's dancing. Krishna's dancing and dancing and dancing and the residents of Braj are looking, watching with amazement at Krishna's dancing on the hoods of the Kaliya serpent. To them, it looked like fancy footwork. But to Kaliya, the weight of Krishna was being felt like the weight of the entire universe on each of his hoods. <laughs> At the same time, it was delicate and delightful. It was also, at the same time, smashing the hoods of the Kaliya serpent. The description is, at the end of this Leela, the hoods of the Kaliya serpent were unrecognizable, totally smashed, beyond recognition. Because Krishna's... So when he would raise his hood, Curbing the pride and envy of Kaliya. And after a long, long time, finally, the enviousness of Kaliya was completely gone by the purifying touch of Krishna's lotus feet. How envious was Kaliya? Just by the touch of his foot upon the serpent that was swallowing Nanda Maharaj, at once that serpent was released, the Gandharva form that had been cursed in that way. The Kali was so envious. Took a lot of touches of Krishna's lotus feet, smashing it, smashing it, smashing it. Finally, he recognized this is not just a small boy who was intruded in my leg. This is the personality of Godhead. His faces were so mangled he couldn't speak anything. But within his heart he could recognize this is the personality of Godhead. And within his heart he surrendered to him. When that stage of the Leela came, the wives of the Kaliya serpent came forward. And they were very smart. They were devotees. There's a nice lesson here. With wives who are pure and elevated being wives of someone who is Kaliya-like. The lesson from this Leela given by our Acharyas is the wife is to remain faithful depending upon Krishna and Krishna will make some correction in due course of time, which Krishna did. So the wives of the Kaliya serpent push their little children forward. In the presence of the little children, Krishna's anger subsided. And then they began offering very, very beautiful prayers. And there's pages and pages of very, very elevated prayers. Their understanding was so profound. They could have been the best of scholars. But they were the wives of the Kaliya serpent. And along with recognizing very clearly the position of the personality of Godhead, 
as Krishna himself. They knew that he's all merciful and they prayed that Krishna forgive the offense and offenses of their husband. And Krishna on their prayers forgave the Kaliya serpent. Following the Kaliya's wives, he also regained a little composure and began offering some very beautiful prayers, very much parallel to the wives' prayers. And then Krishna spoke. And Krishna indicated to Kaliya that I came here this morning just to relieve you of your envious disposition. Now that that has been done, I instruct you to leave this lake so that the waters of the Jamuna can again become fresh and free from this poison that you've deposited here. So, along with his wives, they made offerings to the Personality of Godhead, worshipped him, all types of valuable ornaments and jewels and beautiful garland stretching to his knees, circumambulated Krishna three times and off they went back to Ramanaka Lake. Krishna said to them, to, to Kaliya, when you return there, don't worry that Garuda might come and give you trouble again, because when he sees on your hoods the impressions of my feet, he'll leave you alone. You'll be all right. Garuda won't cause you any difficulty. So they returned to the Ramanaka Lake. Then, this pastime had taken all day long. So Krishna was very cold. He came out of the lake and was warmly embraced by Nanda Maharaj and Mother Jasoda as if life had returned to their bodies. Krishna had returned to their presence. We're going to go tomorrow further down this Parikrama path to Madan Mohan temple that's on top of a hill and the hill is um, the Dasha Aditya Tila. Krishna went there to get warm because cold during the day he called for the sun to come and ten, with the intensity of ten suns Krishna rested on that hill and became again fully warmed we'll go there tomorrow and that evening because it was by that time much later than it is right now and Krishna said rather than going back all the way to Nandagram let us just take rest somewhere in the groves of Vrindavan near the Jamuna River and we'll have a very nice peaceful night so Nanda Maharaj hearing this nice suggestion of Krishna agreed <coughs> and they took rest in one of the forests and that very night was the first of the two forest fire leelas described in the 10th canto of Srimad Bhagavatam. Kaliya represents the envious nature of a conditioned soul. To be envious of someone else in this material world means to be envy of Krishna. Behind that, if someone has something that we wish we had and we're envious of that something that the, that, that other person has, where does that something that other person has come from? It comes from Krishna. The root of enviousness is envy of Krishna. And this condition of being envious of Krishna is what brings us to the material world. Raga, dvesha, samutena, dvandva mohena, bharata. We 
raga, we covet the position of the supreme enjoyer, and dvesha, we have this bad attitude towards the one who is the supreme lord. Simultaneously, raga dvesha samutena man dvandva mohena bharata. One becomes bewildered by this feature of duality, raga and dvesha, towards Krishna. Big problem if one has enviousness in this heart. And we can understand that everyone in this material world would not be here unless there was some envy in the heart. Or say it the other way, if we can become free from envy, we can return to the spiritual world. Or say it the other way, if we can't become free from envy, we won't return to the spiritual world. Krishna, please help us. Place your feet upon our head. Be very kind during the prayers of the Kaliya Serpent, the, the wives of the Kaliya Serpent. They were saying, how fortunate is our husband? Even the goddess of fortune could not imagine such benediction as having the feet of Krishna upon her. She massages Krishna's feet, but placing the feet of the Supreme Lord upon her head and have Krishna dance upon his head. How fortunate. What pious activities might our dear husband have undergone? We don't know what good fortune it is that has brought this mercy. We take it as just your merciful nature. You're just merciful upon our husband. For by the touch of your lotus feet, he's now freed. Now how do we get the feet of Krishna on our heads? We can't run up to the deity and place our head on the feet of the deity. And... The answer is the devotees of the Lord are at the feet of the Supreme Lord. And if we get the favor of the devotees of the Lord, we've gotten the favor of the feet of the Supreme Lord. And if we offend the devotees of the Lord, we've offended the feet of the Lord. Even the devotees may forgive us, the Lord may not. Therefore our teaching is to always seek the favor or try to serve and please the devotees of the Lord. And pray to Krishna to be kind upon us and free us from this miserable condition of raga and dvesha towards him, coveting his position as the supreme enjoyer. Let us place Krishna in the position of the supreme enjoyer. Let Krishna be pleased by all that we do, whatever it is that we're all doing something all the time. Whatever that something is that we do, try to dedicate that to Krishna's happiness, Krishna's pleasure. Put Krishna at the center. And this other tendency to be envious of Krishna being the enjoyer, let it be taken away by Krishna's mercy. You notice this theme of calling for Krishna's mercy. That's like Damodar Lila, trying to serve Krishna in a particular way, but not possible without mercy. So, <coughs> calling out for Krishna's mercy while we're making our endeavors to try to please him in a favorable way. This is our life in devotion to Krishna. So while we're here at the Kaliya Ghat, we can offer our prayers to Krishna that the Kaliya-like tendencies within our heart may Krishna place his lotus feet there instead, taking away all such tendencies from our hearts by his mercy. Shri Krishna Balaram Ki Jai. Yeah.